Local 4 News begins right now with a breaking news alert. Oh, oh look out, there's a fight at home plate. Miguel Cabrera going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Robine, and they're swinging with Hamick. Yes, they were. Breaking right now, chaos at Comerica Park. Punches thrown and a string of bench-clearing brawls between the Tigers and the Yankees. It's coming up, but we're going to begin with a breaking story we need to get to right away. Detroit police issuing an alert about this man. They suspect him of being a child predator. He's in custody, but police are just now revealing he worked at several Metro Detroit daycare centers. Off the top at five, Michael Pankey is facing a slew of federal charges. The fear is, though, that there could be other victims. Let's get out to Jermont Terry. Jermont, there's a lot of moving parts here. There are, Kimberly. Uh, police arrested Michael Pankey back in May, but uh, it appears that uh, a five-year-old told her mother that she was touched inappropriately by Pankey at his house here in Detroit. But it was this week that Detroit police came across, I should say, unraveled some very disturbing information. Now, take a look. Police say that they found pornographic images and videos of children, some possibly produced by Pankey, and they fear that there could be additional victims because, as as you mentioned, Panky worked at several daycares in Metro Detroit over the span of four and a half years. Those daycares are the following. In Sterling Heights, we're talking about the Child Care Center, in Troy, the Garrico Montessori Academy, and, Low and uh, also in Oakland County University, we're talking about the Lowry Center Daycare, and then also in Troy, the North Hills Child Care. These are all the facilities where police say parents need to have a talk with their children. I'm told Panky majored in early childhood education, which meant he has had direct contact to many of these children at these facilities, sometimes alone. He didn't have a prior criminal history. He, he was never been arrested for any of these charges before. Um, this is all new, and so that's why I'm concerned if we have more victims out there, they may not have told anybody, may not have told a parent or the, the teacher at the daycare what happened. To have that talk with your child to rule out any possibility of them being a victim of this guy. And again, Detroit police stressing that parents at those facilities that we listed should have a heart to heart conversation with their children, something parents likely don't want to talk about, but is necessary because Detroit police fearing that M Michael Pankey may have more victims out there. Now, we are aware that many of the facilities are working with Detroit police and the uh, agencies in Troy and also Sterling Heights. But as of right now, none of those facilities have had people come forward saying that the children were victims. But of course, a developing story, Detroit police asking parents to have that heart-to-heart -heart talk about inappropriate touching after Michael Pankey has been arrested and suspected of many cases throughout Metro Detroit. That's the very latest reporting with breaking news. I'm Jermont Terry, Local 4. Okay, Jermont, also breaking a bench-clearing brawl during the Tigers game at Comerica Park this afternoon as Miguel Cabrera starts a fight with a Yankees backup catcher, and it had already been a wild and crazy game. Uh, did not get much better after that either. Bernie's in now with a look at a pretty ugly afternoon. Very ugly. This is just the thing that you hate about baseball games, but it is the kind of day that makes Don King drool. This afternoon at Comerica, Tigers and Yankees bench-clearing brawl early in the game. Michael Fulmer hit Gary Sanchez, who had already hit four home runs in this series. Then in the Detroit sixth, it was payback time. We've got highlights Miguel Cabrera and catcher Austin Romine. Yes, brother of Andrew uh, of the Yankees, and they're John, and then Cabrera loses it. As you saw, pushing, throwing punches. Five players got thrown out in this altercation. Cabrera probably will get suspended since he started it. This wasn't the end. Tiger 7, Dellen Batantis, and this is what you hate to see. In the head, James McCann gets hit, and that's when it is no longer funny. No humor in hitting someone in the head, but Tantos was thrown out. They're still playing at Comerica. Tigers lead it 9-6, to six, playing in the eighth. But there is going to be a lot of cleanup from this mess. Oh, yeah. yeah no doubt about it. Pretty bad stuff. Yeah. More coming up from Bernie a little bit later on. Our other top story tonight, multiple developments after video emerged of Detroit police making a rough arrest. Uh, this video now is in the hands of the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. Now the man arrested in the video has filed a federal lawsuit. We bring in Mara McDonald. I guess two cameras recorded this altercation, Mara. Devin, that's right. Here's the situation. We have the cell phone video, which you see. The chief says there is also store surveillance video, which shows what precipitated this whole thing. Don't you ever 
Put your hands on one of the This is a gas station on Harper on May 31st. Police are having an issue with two men. There's a lot of back and forth going on. Police want the men out of the store, but it all culminates in one of the officers pulling out his mace and spraying one of the men and tackling him to the ground. No, you can just mace the ground. The man on the ground is McKaylee Jackson, and his friend shooting all this is DeMarco Kraft. They filed suit against the DPD for what they say was an unlawful arrest. What you see is their video, but you see there is more video here that we haven't seen yet. When you look at the store video, there's certainly more activity that's occurring prior that led up to that. I will say this, uh, because I saw the video from the store just prior to the deployment of chemical spray. Uh, the officer was, uh, the suspect did take a swing at the officer. Police have that store video, but aren't releasing it yet. As soon as all this went down, the officers in question wrote up a report, which their superiors then reviewed and sent to professional standards for an investigation. That investigation is done and has been sent to the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office for a determination on whether the officers you see here handled themselves appropriately. As far as we're concerned, in terms of the management oversight that was done appropriately, Back here live late tonight, we hear from the attorneys representing the two men that are now suing the DPD. Their attorney says that both of them will be answering questions at a news conference tomorrow. Kimberly Devon, back to you. And any word yet, Mara, on when we'll be able to see the store surveillance video? The chief says he will release that store surveillance yeah. video, but he is waiting for the Wayne County prosecutor to make a decision here about whether there is any criminality on what we see here on this tape. All right, back Mara. to you. Uh, other news today, an investigation underway after firefighters in Clay Township had quite a busy afternoon as a fire ripped through a consumer's energy compressor station. You're looking at video here from Sky 4 over the scene at 26 Mile and I-94. Employees were evacuated from the building. Several fire departments were called to respond to the blaze. Thankfully, there have been no reports of any injuries. A former Marine that acquaintances say was suffering from PTSD was shot and killed by police this morning. This all came following a standoff at his home on Sun Hill in Waterford. Jason Colthorpe is live tonight. Uh, Jason, this is just a tragic chain of events that happened here. It really is, Kim. It all began at 3 a.m. this morning out on that home at Silver Lake where they lived together with their son. A 911 call came into police. It was from the woman who lives there saying her husband had just assaulted her. Once Waterford police showed up, the man inside, 28-year-old Colton Puckett, barricaded himself and threatened to kill police, himself, and even set the home on fire. Police say over the next couple of hours, they would sporadically talk by phone to Puckett, who at one point fired a shot. Eventually, the Oakland County Sheriff's SWAT team surrounded the house, and when Puckett came out a side door armed with a loaded shotgun and charged an officer just before 6 a.m., they opened fire. I heard like five gunshots and then a short pause and I heard another three so that was kind of shocking to wake up to and it was very scary as well. Neighbors in this very quiet secluded area near Silver Lake were stunned. It's really sad especially you know I'm, I'm not opposed to people having guns but when they use them in this way I think it's really not the best. A woman who told me her nephew served with him said Puckett normally was a loving husband and father, but had been suffering from PTSD for years since returning from Afghanistan and had just learned of the deaths of two other Marine buddies in the last three months. When police finally did go in the house this morning, they found gasoline had been poured in numerous, numerous rooms throughout the house and the gas burners on the stove had been turned on. Back to you. Jason, were, were there any kids involved? What well, we don't, they do have a son. We don't know if he was involved in this, but a family member told us this morning he is okay. And I do want to mention this. I just got an email from another uh, friend of Puckett's who uh, has started a fundraiser for his son and his wife, uh, $15,000, reiterating that he's been suffering with PTSD and that his son and his wife were his world. He just lost so many friends and that had just gotten the best of him since he returned from fighting for his country in mm -hmm. the war. And now this money trying to be raised for his son and wife who were left behind. Yeah, what a yeah. tragedy indeed. Okay, Jason, we appreciate it.
Nine soldiers remain missing this evening as the U.S. Navy continues its search and rescue outside Singapore. But sad news came earlier today for one mother in Michigan. Uh, the news we all feared. The U.S. Navy announced earlier today that 22-year-old Kenneth Smith's remains were found by divers. Smith's mother, April Brandon, lives in Milford. He was declared missing after the USS John McCain collided with an oil tanker near Singapore on Monday. Three residents in Michigan are clocking out of work a million dollars richer today after three winning Powerball tickets were reported here at home. The tickets were sold at O'Connor's Deli in Fowlerville, Old West Tobacco in Novi, and Melvindale Liquor, Mark, uh, Melvindale Liquor Market, that's it, in Melvindale. Those three lucky winners matched the first five numbers Wednesday night for a $1 million prize each. $1 million dollars nice. Sure. But... <laughs> Not as nice as what uh, one woman in Massachusetts managed to get by hitting the big jackpot by herself. Not time. just any jackpot either. This largest single ticket jackpot prize in U.S. history. Uh, this lady that you're looking at here is Mavis Wanzik. She is 53 years old. She's a mother of two. She spent the last 30 plus years as a hospital worker, but not anymore. Mavis hit the historic $758.7 million Powerball jackpot, and now she won't have to worry about working at the hospital anymore. I work currently at Mercy Medical Center, and um, I was there for 32 years, and I was a unit extender patient care type thing. Are so you we're, still there, or are you... I'm, I've called, I haven't told them I will not be coming back. <laughs> of course what not. What two weeks' notice? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, if you're wondering, she opted for the lump sum of $480 million. Her plan now is to just kind of sit back, take it all in, and just relax a little bit. I recommend changing phone numbers first. <laughs> That's true. Immediately. Uh, just getting started on this uh, Thursday. Ahead over this next hour of news, uh, this man spent 25 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. Now he wants the people who made the mistake to pay a very steep price. And in good health, the very real chance your child could actually be allergic to school. Hi, Ben. Hey, Kim. Kind of a uh, gray, gloomy day that we're finishing up out there with temperatures in the mid-60s. It was a cool start this morning, but wait till you see where we start out tomorrow. That's coming up. I'm Nick Monticelli in Dearborn Heights. Take a look at this video taken from inside of this 7-Eleven. A man tries to rob the place, jumping on top of the counter and firing his shots. But there's an interesting twist to the story that you won't believe. New at 6. A couple thought their puppy got out of their yard until surveillance video showed him being stolen. At 6, the message they have for the two men who took Thor. He owed almost $2,000 for unpaid traffic tickets and court fines, but it's what he did to pay off his debt that has him facing prison time. All right, now here at 5, take a good look at the video we have. Security cameras capturing a robbery inside a Dearborn Heights 7-Eleven, and detectives are hoping you know who this is. It happened around 5 a.m. on Cherry Hill in Dearborn Heights. The robber even fired a shot at the clerk, but as Nick Monticelli reports, things took a strange twist. So here's the thing. It does not take a genius to realize that there are security cameras all over this 7-Eleven in Dearborn Heights. It's the camera inside that caught this robber and shooter in the act. But what you don't see in that video is what happened earlier. He tried to rob the place in the same night. He fired, fired a shot up in the, uh, up in the air. A little machine gun looking thing, too. It was scary. It was not, not a happy day around. Benny is a regular at this 7 Eleven on Cherry Hill in Dearborn Heights. He gets a coffee here almost every day. But today, this happened. Uh, he, was, he was on a mission from God. He, he scared us. We ran out. The robbery was early this morning, which you can clearly see in their surveillance video. He walks in, gun drawn, jumps on top of the counter, and then shoots at the clerk, but misses. The clerk and Benny ran out as fast as they could. I was high footing it out of there. I didn't want to spend any more time. I had my coffee. I was ready to go home. The robber then spends just a minute trying to break into the cash register. He can't, so he takes what appears to be just one bottle of liquor. All of that in armed robbery and potentially attempted murder for a bottle of booze. And this was his second try that night. Dearborn Heights investigators say the first time the clerk fought him off with a bat. He actually committed a, attempted to commit a robbery earlier in the night with a knife in which the, uh, the clerk fought him off and uh, he came back with a handgun this time to finish the job. After the robbery, someone across the street saw the getaway car leaving. Police tracked it down. There was a short chase ending just blocks away. 
That driver was arrested, but the robber was nowhere to be found. So again, they have the driver of that vehicle, but they still want the man who actually went inside of this 7-Eleven with that gun. So if you recognize him from that surveillance video, please call Dearborn Heights Police or Crime Stoppers. That number is 1-800-SPEAK-OFF. In Dearborn Heights, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. Okay, Nick, and as Nick mentioned, because the robber fired a shot at the clerk, the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office will decide if there should be attempted murder charges on top of the armed robbery charges. I was telling you that my family is in town visiting from South from, Carolina. Yes. Uh, when I got up this morning, they were all kind of bundled up in blankets, <laughs> asking me to turn the air conditioning off because it was chilly. I'm ready to head home They're for a little while. Yeah. Oh, I've been hiding in the corner today <laughs> yeah, to avoid yeah, some yeah. of this. Uh, but yeah, it is going to get colder tonight than what we saw last yeah, night. Wow. Uh, and you can tell out there this, uh, well, we've kind of lost summer, at least for a short time here. Mid 60s is where we sit on this side of the state. Temperatures have gotten as cool now as 61 in Howell. Jackson also at 61. In fact, that is one of the cooler parts of the state. And when you look at the difference between today and yesterday, you can tell that uh, definitely things are, are cooler here anywhere but about 10 degrees cooler in most locations. Couple spots closer to 15 uh, within that pocket out there. But we will be seeing this clouds clear out tonight. And as we tell you a lot of times, that's really gonna, not going to help out as far as temperatures go because it's going to allow those numbers to drop tonight. And that'll be the case as we head towards a daybreak tomorrow. As far as the rain goes, we've got a couple sprinkles that we've been seeing uh, run across the area, especially up in Santa Lake County, uh, but this is going to be light uh, as far as the amounts of moisture go, so we're really not anticipating a lot in the way of rainfall, and the uh, clouds are going to move out tonight. Let's take you down to Texas. Of course, this is the big weather story in the U.S. right now. This is Hurricane Harvey. Uh, it has become a hurricane. It is rapidly strengthened and is expected to become a major hurricane as it makes landfall near the Texas coast. By the way, this is the new GO-16 satellite. This is the first hurricane season that we have had this new satellite imagery. Hopefully this is helping the folks down in the Hurricane Center uh, get things a little bit more squared away as that storm heads towards the Texas coast. We'll have a lot more coming up on Local 4 News at 530. Back home, just a couple sprinkles tonight. As those fade, the clouds take off with it, and that's going to leave us mainly clear tomorrow morning and very chilly. We'll look at those lows in our four zone forecast in a second, but beyond that, it's going to be a lot of sunshine, a lot of mainly clear skies to finish the week in the weekend. Saturday and Sunday look a little bit warmer, so we're trying to regain some of that warmth. Probably not going to see showers back in the forecast until um, for most of us on Tuesday. So here are those low temperatures tonight and not quite as mild as what we saw last night. We'll call it 53 in the city. West Bloomfield Clinton Township, you're going to be teetering on that 50 degree mark. South zone numbers, this is where we're going to see some 40s. Waterford, at, or I should say Blissfield at 46. Uh, Dundee's at 47. Milan, you'll be at that number as well. Mid 40s, coolest numbers out here in our West zone are going to be uh, furthest away from the east side. 45 in Howell, Fenton, and Flint. And in our north zone, those numbers in the mid 40s as well. 45 in North Branch. Lapeer may be one of the chilliest spots at 44. And we'll keep things just a little bit milder towards the lakes around 50 degrees. Rebounding to the 70s tomorrow afternoon with the help of that sunshine. Just going to be a cool start to begin with. And then close to 80 by the uh, end of the weekend, start of next week. But Officially, we won't see 80 in that forecast for the next seven days, so below average all the way through Thursday of next week. What do you think, family sticking around? Or? I don't think no, so. That's going to do it. <laughs> Early trip back to South <laughs> Carolina. Right. <laughs> all right, Ben, thanks. Well, um, it didn't just happen once. New tonight, two major scares at Metro in just one day. We'll show you what sent TSA agents scrambling. Hank? A major recall affecting thousands of pounds of chicken sold all across the country. What you need to know to protect yourself and your family in my Help Me Hank recall alert. A major food recall just announced and one store now increasing hours for employees to better serve their customers. Our consumer investigator Hank Winchester is here bringing us consumer headlines making news across the country today. Hank. First, take a look inside your refrigerator. More than 20,000 pounds of chicken from the company called Expresco being recalled because of a possible listeria contamination. You see the product right there. Uh, that recall also, though, applies to garlic and herb chicken skewers. It also affects West End Cuisine Mediterranean chicken skewers. Now, the affected packaging has the number 36 inside the stamp. You see it right there in that small lettering. If you have some of these products, throw them away. To find out more information, 
head to the Help Me Hank page at clickondetroit.com. All right, talking about a store located in many parts of Metro Detroit and around the country, we're talking about Lowe's. They're investing in customer service. The company announcing it will increase employee hours during peak times. A spokesperson saying the company is now dealing with the effect of the hot housing market. A lot of customers looking for renovation and construction products, and they're seeing more people in their stores during peak hours. It's not going to change the actual hours of operation, just the amount of people walking around that may be able to offer you some help. And finally, a new study reveals that many of us are living paycheck to paycheck. In fact, Career Builder surveyed more than 5,800 people across the country. 78% said they're just trying to make ends meet right now. That is up 3% from last year, and it affects more women than men. The study also found having a higher salary does not always mean less financial concern or worry. In fact, one in 10 workers making $100,000 or more say right now they're also living paycheck to paycheck. I'm Hank Winchester. Help me, Hank. New at 530. Racing for the worst. Hurricane Harvey takes dead aim at the Texas coast, only expected to get stronger before making landfall. We all know Justin Verlander throws the heat, right? Well, I met someone today who's pretty confident in his skills as well. I made 100. You hit 100? Yeah. <laughs> a big honor for a man celebrating his birthday today at Comerica Park. Did he throw like JV? A man who was wrongfully convicted of murder and spent 25 years in prison has filed a lawsuit. I just don't want this to happen to nobody else. And it could happen to anybody. We'll tell you how much money he's asking for and who's on the other end of that lawsuit. Next week. He spent 25 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. Now, he wants the people who put him behind bars to pay $125 million for their mistake. Desmond Ricks had a five-day-old daughter the day that he was arrested. The next time he'd see her as a free man was after her 25th birthday. Ricks was convicted of murder in 1992. Decades later, his case was thrown out. Well, now he wants Detroit police to pay up for the errors that they made in the case. Coco McAvoy spoke with him today. Coco, he says he was framed. Yes, Devin and Karen, what happened to Desmond Ricks was just wrong. There was no eyewitness, no physical evidence, and the bullets used as evidence in the case were fabricated. So now he has filed a lawsuit and he's asking for $125 million. I didn't want to die in prison. This was the day Desmond Ricks was freed from prison. Now, a couple of months later, he's suing for $125 million. I just don't want this to happen to nobody else, and it could happen to anybody. Ricks's lawyer, Wolf Mueller, says a lawsuit is filed against the city of Detroit, the Detroit Police Department evidence technician, David Pouch, and the officer in charge of the 1992 investigation, Donald Staywitz, both retired from the force. 25 years that were stolen, not by mistake, they were stolen by police misconduct. Police pinned the 1992 murder of Jerry Bennett on Ricks by using fabricated gun evidence after taking a gun from Ricks's mother's house. So we can tell where lands and grooves are. This is a five bullet. A five bullet cannot make, cannot come out of a six right gun. That's impossible. Ricks believes he was framed by the Detroit Police Department. They know what they did to me. I know what they did to me. And now you know and he knows. Everybody knows what they did to me. So it's no secret no more. The secret's out now. He spent decades locked up away from his family and now wants justice for the injustice he was served. The money is kind of like a, a sugar coat or whatever, but it's not going to coat the problem. It's not going to do it. No, I'm going to have to correct that. I'm going to have to take it upon myself to say what they did to me. I'm not going to let that define the rest of my life. And the crime lab that was operating back in 1992 was shut down after a 2008 audit showing misconduct. Back to you. Well, Coco, if Ricks wins the lawsuit, what could happen to the, the former Detroit Police Department employees? Does that, does that mean a possibility of prison time or what? It doesn't seem like they'll face prison time at this time only because of statute of limitations. However, they are each being charged uh, $25 million in punitive damages, and they may be responsible for paying that. Wow. All right, Coco.
Well, from Beaumont to Brownsville, the Texas Gulf Coast under the gun right now. Yes, as Hurricane Harvey gains intensity as it marches closer to the shore, Ben is tracking the growing storm tonight, and this is serious, Ben. It is very serious, Karen. Uh, there are blue skies in Houston right now. That's the live picture from the coast, but that is definitely going to change as Harvey could grow to a major Category 3 hurricane before making landfall sometime late tomorrow. Preparations are underway along the coast of Texas as Hurricane Harvey churns in the Gulf. Forecasters warning the storm could gain strength and become a major Category 3 storm over the next 24 hours. That would be the first major hurricane to make landfall in the U.S. in nearly a dozen years. All across the potential strike zone, residents are racing to get ready. So I got four things of water and some formula for the baby. In Beaumont, sandbags are being filled. And along the coast, FEMA is pre-positioning supplies and generators. Corpus Christi residents are stocking up on water and other necessities. Shelves left bare in some places. We are going to, in the strongest possible terms, encourage the residents in the low-lying areas as they say, get out of Dodge. In Houston, signs went up Wednesday warning of the storm. Make sure that you have what you need, lanterns, uh, flashlights, extra batteries, all of that, especially food and water. Forecasters warn this storm has the potential to bring winds well over 110 miles an hour, a deadly storm surge, and as much as two feet of rain in some areas. The Lone Star State and millions of residents squarely in the bullseye as Hurricane Harvey bears down. And I want to amend uh, what I said in that story because the five o'clock advisory has just come out from the Hurricane Center and it looks like this storm is going to continue generally on its same path until it makes landfall late tomorrow night or early Saturday morning as a category three storm. But then watch what happens. There is nothing good out of this setup for the folks in Texas. There's a lot of warm water. It is going to start basically meandering over the coast after it makes landfall. There's nothing to really steer it and push it out. The National Hurricane Center is now saying that there could be isolated amounts of up to 35 inches of rain in parts of coastal Texas. That is insane. Uh, they're using words like life threatening and devastating. So in addition to having to deal with the winds of a category three storm, uh, you've got this rainfall that won't quit for days once that storm actually makes land. It's not inches. That's a yard right. of, of rain. Exactly wow. right. And yeah. that can be right. deadly as yeah. well. All right. Thank you, Ben. Well, two loaded guns were confiscated by TSA officers Wednesday at Detroit Metro Airport. The guns were confiscated in two separate instances at security checkpoints. The first was found in a Philadelphia-bound passenger's carry-on bag. The second was found later on a Connecticut-bound passenger's carry-on luggage. TSA immediately notified police who responded to the checkpoint and arrested both passengers. Across Michigan tonight, stories from Horseshoe Island in Lake Michigan and from Muskegon. Let's start this roundup, though, in Grand Rapids. Uh, that's where police say alcohol is believed to have been a factor in a crash that left a person and a dog dead. Happened Wednesday evening. Police say a couple was out for a walk with their dog when they were hit. The 75-year-old woman was killed. Her 77-year-old companion was left with serious injuries. The driver of the car, a 34-year-old woman, reportedly cooperating, but she was not injured. Also in West Michigan, a search for a missing kayaker comes to an end for the U.S. Coast Guard. 20-year-old Joseph Quagliano of Wisconsin body was found Wednesday near a small island on Lake Michigan, four days after his kayak washed ashore. Officials say he was reported missing Saturday night. The Coast Guard sent three different helicopters in the search efforts. Those who knew Sina or heard his story will have another chance to say goodbye and to thank the war dog for his service. U.S. Marine Corps veteran dog passed away Wednesday after battle with terminal bone cancer. Sina was 10 years old, had served three tours of duty in Afghanistan before uh, retiring, if you will, at, uh, in 2014. Sina will be laid to rest at noon Saturday at the Michigan War Dog Memorial. That's in South Lyon, and Sina will receive full military honors. Detroit Mayor Duggan was on hand today for the graduation for the first two cohorts of the, uh, of the Detroit at Work Healthcare Training Initiative. And along with the mayor was the dean of Oakland University School of Nursing and other dignitaries to congratulate the graduating class who has spent time with the initiative preparing for in-demand jobs in several fields. People who go into healthcare go into healthcare because there's something in their heart that says they want to help people. And when you get a chance to go to work every day, with a whole lot of other people who have that in their heart, it is such a special thing.
by the collaborative efforts of Detroit employment. The health care training is a collaboration between the city of Detroit, St. John's Providence, Henry Ford Health Systems, and Detroit Medical Center. Tonight, the Red Cross says there is an urgent need for blood donors, especially O negative and O positive blood types. Local Forest teamed with Gardner White and the Red Cross to host blood drives across Metro Detroit to try to help fill that need. Pam German was at the Auburn Hills Drive thanking donors. Her mom, Rose, battled cancer for 12 years. She needed a number of transfusions. Pam has sponsored her own blood drive, in fact, for the past 15 years to pay back that kindness. It meant the world to me that people came together, that, that they helped my mom. And I'm hoping I can help one of their loved ones or them. And you can help too. You can donate today until 745. So about another two hours to go at the Gardner White stores in Auburn Hills, Canton, Macomb, Warren, Waterford and Taylor. And until 715 at the store in Brighton. We've got all of the details on our health page at clickondetroit.com. Some students are already back in school. The rest will soon follow. But could your child actually be allergic to school? You used to feel that way, didn't you? <laughs> you know, I think we all did at some point. It sounds like the ultimate excuse, but experts say heading back to class actually can trigger allergy symptoms in many students. Kimberly Gill joins us now to explain what this is all about. Yeah, mom, dad, school's making me sick. Of course. How about that? Well, doctors say back to school can basically be the perfect storm for allergy sufferers. It's bad enough that ragweed pollen is ramping up, but then you add in dusty classrooms, bus fumes, and countless other triggers too. 11 year old Reagan Ensminger may be the only middle schooler to say this. The good thing is maybe bad, but we don't have recess anymore. Reagan says being outside too long triggers her allergies, which tend to be worse at the beginning of the school year. Let's say I go into a library, I'll sneeze there because the dust and um, all the um, old stuff. Classroom triggers include dust mites, mold or even chalk dust. Dr. Joel Anthes says some parents may notice a child suffering allergy symptoms for the first time. A child that's always having to uh, breathe through their mouth, that can be one symptom of allergies. A child that is certainly more obviously if they're having itchy, watery eyes, runny nose, using a Kleenex all the time. Dr. Anthes says you can try over-the-counter antihistamines like non-drowsy Claritin or nasal steroids like Flonase, but if those don't work, see your child's doctor. Reagan is trying a type of immunotherapy which trains her body to fight off the allergens. It's available in drops instead of shots. There was uh, drops or the shots. I no, no shots for me today. <laughs> I hate shots. I hate needles. Most kids do. Adults yeah. do too. Uh, doctors say back to school is particularly tough for children with allergies and asthma. In addition to suffering symptoms, they're also more likely to catch the upper respiratory infections that go around when students get back together in close quarters. So welcome back to school. Those, those <laughs> old school buildings, the way they have such character. Yeah. <laughs> Just hiding Do other things as well. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Thanks, Kim. Well, Starbucks could be making a move into the seafood industry. Ahead here at 530, the bizarre new menu item they're rolling out in hopes of drawing in some new customers. Jamie. We're down below Comerica Park. George here is about to celebrate his 100th birthday by throwing out the first pitch. You ready? Right. He's ready. He says he's got a curveball coming up. All right, Jamie, but first, uh, he says he felt like he was hit by a car. What happened to a man out on a paddleboard that threw him into the water and immediately shut down the beach? Next. It all comes new at six. Michigan is being hit with several very serious tree diseases and viruses. We take a look at what's going on with Michigan's trees. A popular Cape Cod beach remains closed today following a shark attack. It was a close call Wednesday for a 69-year-old. Cleveland Bigelow was paddleboarding when a shark took a chunk out of his board, causing him to fall and injure his leg. But he's think, though, it wasn't worse. I count my blessings uh, from, from God because when I'm paddling, if I had been still prone and paddling and it bit there, I probably wouldn't have an arm. Despite the scare, Bigelow says he'll be back in the water. Officials say the sharks were probably hunting for seals, not people, since they swim near the shore this time of year.
At the first pitch at a Major League Baseball game is nerve-wracking for just about anyone. What happened today at Comerica Park was pretty special. At 100 years of age, Dr. George McGill got the honor of a lifetime, and it turns out throwing the first pitch was just part of it. Jamie Edmonds was there. It's been quite a year for George Mogul, the former World War II doctor who cared for soldiers in France after D-Day and for Detroiters in his family practice for decades, turned 100 on July 28th, and he and his family have been celebrating ever since. Today is a culmination of that century celebration. Yeah. Are you a big Tigers fan? Absolutely. For how long? All my life. Mogul is scheduled to throw out the first pitch, and let me tell you, he's been practicing. I hope they cheer for him. He's been working out two days a week. Uh, hopefully the arm will hold up and he'll be uh, ready to go when it's time to, to shine. It's Grandparents Day at Comerica Park, which is fitting considering Mogul is a grandfather times 10 and a great grandfather times five. But don't let that fool you. He plans to bring the heat. Uh, what kind of pitch are you going to throw? A curve. <laughs> Finally, the moment has arrived. Four generations walked out onto the field. Each handed the ball to Papa, and he let it rip. There are no words to explain. There are no words that are good enough to tell the world what this feels like. So after George threw the heat to Alex Presley, I said, congratulations, what a day. Do you know what Dr. Mogul said to me? It'll be better if the Tigers win. I guess he has one final birthday wish. At Comerica Park, Jamie Edmonds, Local 4.